So I'd like to talk about um, the vaccine supply. Obviously, that's a, just a subset of the, the larger issues that are involved. But uh, this is an issue that you know, I've been working on together with a large group of economists. Uh, you'll see some of the, uh, the, the people on the left, as well as uh, uh, statisticians with uh, expertise on epidemiology. We recently, uh, just a few days ago, uh, came out with an article in Science, and we also have an article that will be in the American Economic Review pap uh, Papers and Proceedings issue. So these are not, these two articles are really take a global perspective. They're not focusing on South Asia in particular, but uh, you would love to share some of the results and, and would love to uh, discuss uh, what, what's, what's relevant to South Asia. Okay. Um, we're also, I should say, we're also working on a third paper on the issue of how to uh, best allocate existing vaccine supplies. So the first two papers focus on uh, investments in vaccine and increasing the supply of vaccines. And the third one is how to use the existing supply more efficiently. Each month, COVID-19 kills uh, around 300,000 people and reduces global GDP by about $500 billion. Um, and I should note that more comprehensive uh, measures of harm are much higher. So, uh, for example, Cutler and Summers did an estimate for the U.S. Uh, that includes the value of health. In fact, probably doesn't even capture everything because it doesn't take into account the disruption to education and the long-run impact of that on human capital. Um, but they estimate $800 billion per month just for the U.S., um, so really uh, an order of magnitude higher. Um, you know, in, in our papers, we sort of assume that total economic costs are, are twice GDP costs. Um, so you know, then, then you might think that there's you know, globally a, a trillion dollars a month uh, being lost. And accelerating vaccination could help avert those costs, both the human costs and the economic costs, more quickly. And I think it's it's immediately apparent from those numbers that even a small acceleration of vaccination um, generates tremendous uh, human and economic benefits. Now, how can you ex how do you get acceleration of vaccination coverage? Well, there there really there are three elements. I'm focusing on two here. The first one um, we did some of would have been ideally we would have done more, um, and that is invest early on. So it, it, many countries in, made investments before we knew for sure whether the vaccines would work, while the vaccines were still being tested. And I think that made a, made a lot of sense. The second element is large-scale capacity investment. So why is large-scale capacity investment important? Well, roughly speaking, the time until vaccination is the number of people who need to be vaccinated divided by the capacity. That gives you how many months it's going to take to do the, do the vaccination. Um, so increasing the capacity, in some ways, it's like you're trying to fill a bucket. And if you have a narrow diameter pipe, it's going to take a long time. If you have a wide diameter pipe, you can fill the bucket much faster. Uh, uh, having a lot of uh, capacity to produce um, more vaccines each year is, uh, or each month is going to um, it's like a, a wider diameter pipe. Um, one thing to note is that's going to be particularly useful for the people who are at the back of the queue, so to speak. So if it, imagine it was going to take two years to vaccinate everybody in the world. Well, if we double capacity, that could be done in a year. That shortens the queue by a year for the, for the people at the back of the queue. It's short if you're just one month into the queue, then it, it saves you a, a fortnight. So it's a much um, it's it's this is actually increasing capacity promotes global equity. The the final element is efficient use of existing vaccine capacity, and I'll, I'll discuss that later on in the talk. Um, okay, why don't we go on to the next slide? One thing that our, our work suggests is that the social value of early investment and large-scale capacity investment is much greater than the private value to a vaccine manufacturer. So 
if you remember those numbers that I cited on the at, at the beginning on the um, on the social cost of the epidemic, um, using those types of numbers, and those are those in turn come from numbers from the World Bank and the IMF and, and others. Um, we estimate the value of additional vaccine capacity um, at you know, between six hundred and a thousand dollars per course. That's the value of adding on additional doses to where we are. Now that depends a lot on when that's ready. If we could have it ready by April, um, then it would be um, you know closer to a thousand dollars per course. To ready by July, uh, closer to six hundred dollars. But either way, that dwarfs the price per course that is that vaccine producers are going to make. You know, that's depending on the vaccine, anywhere between six dollars and forty dollars per course. So the so now society has made some choices, um, and for, you know there are many good reasons for this to say we're not going to pay um, the the uh, we're not going to pay the full marginal uh, value of this to society. We're not going to pay all of that to the vaccine producers. Um, you know, um, and but what that does mean is that there's a gap. And while there may be very good reasons for that, it means there's a gap between the, the social value of the vaccine and the purely commercial incentives to invest in expanding capacity. So this is a situation where the marginal benefit of vaccine capacity is much greater than the marginal cost of, uh, uh, well, much greater than the, the value to the producer um, and uh, likely much greater than the marginal cost. And that means that we can't necessarily just count on um, on on, uh, on the response of the vaccine producers under existing um, institutions to produce the optimal amount of vaccine capacity. And there may be a case uh, for for carefully craft, crafted public policy. Thanks. Why don't we go on to the next slide? Um, so. There are a number of, of, um, of entities, national governments uh, like the US or India or um, um, made advanced deals for billions of courses. And COVAX uh, made some deals as well. The World Bank has put aside $12 billion in financing uh, for vaccination, which can be used for vaccine purchases. My, I may be out of date on this, and I, I, I know there are many people from the World Bank uh, at the meeting um, my impression is that countries that right now that 12 billion, that a substantial amount of that 12 billion dollars uh, it remains and is available to countries for for financing vaccine purchases. Um, and you know, one of the questions are that we've tried to ask in our work is, would it be worth it for countries to borrow to finance those vaccine purchases for beyond the 20 percent of the population that might be covered by COVAX? Um, and you know, generally, it looks like it it, it would be. Um, the uh, I wouldn't even say generally. Actually, even for very low income countries, this looks like a fantastic uh, investment. Another question is: you know, Would further investments in vaccine capacity now uh, be beneficial? And how to structure them most efficiently? And then uh, um, how can we use our existing capacity more efficiently? Can we go on to the next slide? Um, so let me start out with this question of, of the, uh, the value of vaccine capacity um, and then, um, then talk about you know, ways, um, how to structure exp expansions, contracts for expansion of vaccine capacity. And, um, and then finally, how to use existing capacity better. Can we go on to the next slide? Uh, we can advance again. Um, so, you know, if we there's some rough calculations of the uh, of the value of of existing capacity are are on this slide. Um, you know, there's it's actually a, a somewhat complicated question to get at how much capacity we currently have. Um, you know, there have been various announcements, but there's also been delays in ability to uh, to to produce in some cases. You know, we'll take uh, 3 billion courses as our baseline with half coming online in January, half in April. Um, 
Um, in that case, we estimate that existing capacity is worth $17.4 trillion, or $5,800 per, per course. So just enormously valuable investment, the investments we already made. Um, you can then say, well, what would be the, the, um, the impact of, of expanding this capacity? Um, the, um, and you know, I think that, um, why don't we, um, let me go on to the next slide for that. So what would be the value of additional capacity? Um, well, as I indicated before, it depends on, on, uh, on when it's available. Um, so if, if capacity could be available in, in, um, in April, we estimate close to $1 trillion of value. Um, if it's available in, in July, um, more like uh, uh, 600 billion. It, um, so that corresponds to anywhere from a thousand to six hundred dollars uh, per course, course of capacity. I think that you know why the big gap. It really highlights the value of speed. Um, the and of course this is assuming a three billion dollar baseline. It would have been higher if we if we have negative shocks to supply and have less available. Uh, would be less if we have more capacity available. But still, even in those more conservative scenarios. Um, Say we had four billion in baseline capacity, and the the benefit only comes available in in Ju July. The new capacity only comes available then. Still, you would get benefits of roughly two hundred and sixty dollars per course uh, compared to the price of six to forty dollars right now. And the analysis suggests that's you know, good value not just for high income countries uh, but also for LMICs. So since we're in a situation in which the social value of additional capacity now would be high, the question is how can we how can we best go about um, trying to obtain that capacity? We can go to the next slide. And is it even possible? So you know, there's debate. Um, there's um, you know some people will argue that all feasible capacity is is currently being used. But you know, there could also be opportunities to install new factories or repurpose existing ones or, or find new ways to increase yield um, in existing processes or find you know, creative ways to get more raw material supplies. Now, you know, the value of that would be much higher than the price. So even though the in initially available capacity that you know, uh, has been brought into production at the existing price, um, uh, even if that has been used up, it may be worth soliciting bids from firms for capacity expansion to identify possible investments. And you know, that's a step that we think makes sense. You'll notice that I've written that the governments could do this. Um, this is also something that international organizations could do. You know, it's, it's, uh, it depends on the size of the country. Obviously, South Asia has, has large enough countries that um, um, perhaps uh, those governments could solicit bids themselves. Um, but I think if, if we think about um, some smaller countries, either in the region or globally, uh, it may make sense for international organizations, it probably does make sense for international organizations to be soliciting the bids. Uh, so that could be, for example, Gavi or COVAX um, could solicit bids. Obviously, they would need um, a, a financing lined up to, to, to be able to um, uh, in, encourage uh, the bids to come in. Uh, can we go on to the next slide? How should the contracts be structured? Well, if the contracts specify the number of doses without delivery dates, then um, you know, producers might just not expand their capacity and just add countries to the back of the queue. And you know, the, the firm's incentives in that case to fulfill orders more quickly would be much less than the social benefits of doing so. So, you know, if, um, if you think about this, it's like hiring a contractor to work on a on a home construction project. Um, you know, the contractor has, in many cases, will come back and say, "I couldn't get the work done in time. You know, I'll just do it later." At that point, it's very difficult to do anything about it. Well, how do you address that? Well, on large scale commercial construction contracts. There are often penalty or bonus clauses for speed. 
the issue here is that the um, you know, trying to have penalties or bonuses that match the social value of speed would require you know, very, very large penalty or bonus clauses. And that's would the level of risk involved uh, would 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 uh, probably not be acceptable um, since there are factors outside anybody's control, which can affect um, how how, um, how quickly vaccines can come online. Um, I think the you might also risk unintended consequences if you had that um, that type of in, very very um, if you had massive penalties or bonuses of the order of magnitude of hundreds of billions of dollars that we've been talking about. That's just a, a non-starter. So I think what what makes sense is that contracts should include provisions for capacity expansion. In particular, it makes sense to have companies submit bids of what they need to do to expand their capacity, and then to offer to cover those costs. Uh, what do we go on to the next slide? Um, I think it's going to be important not just to try to increase final capacity, but also to think about supply chains. So we're in a situation in which society has decided that we're not going to, we're going to have some limits on pricing. We're not going to have, have prices reflect the marginal social value. Um, and in, in, in the middle of the pandemic, in the middle of an emergency. Uh, and some companies like AstraZeneca have um, explicitly said they're doing this on a nonprofit basis. I think even companies that are doing this uh, haven't made those pledges. They're aware that if they tried to charge too much, you know, they would face a, a political uh, per, uh, blowback. So now, as I say, there may be very good reasons for that, but we need to think about what are the consequences uh, for, the, for, the, for the system as a whole. And one important consequence might be for supply chains. So if there's high demand for vaccine production, but if it's not possible for the intermediate input producers to, um, to, to raise, if there, well, if there are limits on the extent to which they can raise prices, we might not have a sufficient supply of inputs. So here's the logic. You have a large expansion of vaccine capacity, and we have seen a huge expansion, much bigger than anybody would have anticipated. That will cause a spike in demand for inputs. Now, meeting that re might require a large-scale increase in manufacturing capacity for the inputs. We may need to uh, build new factories, for example. But if the demand increase is temporary, and of course, we don't know. It may well be, and it seems likely that we'll need COVID vaccines on an ongoing basis. But there's at least some risk. If you're thinking about building a factory to produce inputs. There's a risk that you that, that capacity won't be uh, used for the next 20, 20 years, that it'll be idle in the long run. And this could be a capacity investment that would normally last uh, 20 years and would be amortized over that period. But if you don't know that um, you've got a short demand for that period, then you might be reluctant to make that investment. That means if, if, inve if the pri output price is fixed at normal values, it might be hard to justify that investment commercially. You know, what's the solution? Well, you know, there are a number of ways to address this. Um, but again, one possible approach would be for public financing to help support investment in intermediate input capacity. Again, companies could submit bids, say how much it would cost them to increase uh, production of, you know, whether it's a bioreactor, whether it's bioreactors, whether it's uh, uh, delivery devices, some of these things are, are going to be more relevant than others, uh, or in fact, just uh, inputs in vaccine production. Um, the um, companies could submit bids for that, uh, how much it would cost to do that, and then they could, that could be publicly uh, supported. Um, to enable rapid capacity expansion for future investment, for future pandemics, you know, it's going to be very important to put these uh, advanced investment in supply chains. I think it's really, maybe I can come back to this in, in Q&A, but we've been thinking about the COVID-19 epidemic. Um, a lot of people are very concerned that countries, some countries, you know, bought up supply early on. Um, you know, there's multiple ways to see that issue. But clearly, if we're thinking about the possibility of future future pandemics, you know the best the best uh, 
antidote to uh, destructive competition to try to get uh, get to lock up supply is to make sure there's lots of uh, capacity in advance and um, big global public investment in supply chains uh, could be could be very important in in trying to address that. Why don't we why don't we go into the next uh, slide? Okay. Um, okay. So this is. Um, let me switch uh, switch gears now. So up till now, I've been talking about how can we increase vaccine capacity. The second, the the other topic that I wanted to address is, you know, given the capacity we have, are there ways to use it more efficiently? And here, you know, this is work that we're that we're that's currently in progress. Um, I, you know, this is obviously going to be up to medical people as it should be to make these decisions, but uh, have been involved in some modeling on the potential benefits of some ways of, of, um, of basically stretching our vaccine supply, getting more out of our existing supply. So I uh, wanted to talk about the potential benefits of this. The one approach is, is the first dose is first. Um, so giving the second dose after 12 weeks rather than four weeks. That obviously can allow more people to receive the first dose sooner. And there seems likely, uh, based on, on our reading of the evidence, that uh, the first dose conveys a lot of the overall protection. So that you know, some modeling we've done suggests that could substantially reduce mortality and infections. Um, the UK adopted the strategy. You know, early data from the UK seems to support that idea. Um, the um, the Giving um, second doses, um, uh, you know, another approach would be to say um, maybe there could be some subset of the population they got the uh, two doses in in you know after a four week delay. So maybe the uh, most at risk populations uh, could get them um, uh, after the sh shorter delay, but others we could you know, once we get past the, those most critical populations. Another strategy would be to do first doses first outside of the most critical populations. You know, another approach would be to say, if people are previously infected, they only get one dose, um, but people who've, who've uh, others get, get both doses. So there are a variety of strategies along these lines, and you know, some modeling we've done suggests potentially very large benefits of this. Okay. Um, let me go into the next slide. You know, another approach would be to adjust the dosage. So early in the, the standard uh, the standard thing that um, um, makes sense in most situations is to design the dosage to maximize the trade-off side effects uh, against efficacy and choose the dosage that's optimal for whoever's getting the vaccine in their in their arms. Now this is a situation, and that makes complete sense when there's when you know vaccines is available in, in full, uh, as you, know, you can buy as much vaccine as you, as is needed, and it's and the cost is relatively low relative to the benefits. There's no real need to focus on conserving vaccine supply. In this situation, where it may take years, uh, you may take a couple of years to vaccinate the whole world. Um, you know the the extra vaccine that you could save could be very valuable for somebody else and for society as a whole. So there's at least a case for taking not just a medical approach to this, thinking about the individual patient getting the vaccine, but a public health approach that thinks about the population as a whole. I think that's reinforced because just like we don't really know the optimal t amount of time between the first and second dose, only some things have been tested, not everything. We don't really know the optimal dosage for vaccines. You know, certain things were tried um, and we have evidence on the, their impact. But we don't have, uh, we don't know for sure what's what's optimal, even from the standpoint of the individual. Now, um, if there's, it could well be, and uh, my understanding is that um, there could it could be that much lower doses would be would would work very well from the standpoint of an individual patient. You know, we don't know that for sure, but it seems possible. Um, you know, there's one interpretation of some AstraZeneca results suggests that a, a half dose, there was a mistake during the trial. Um, one interpretation of that is that a half dose followed by a full dose might be 
more effective than the full dose. There are other you know, interpretations of that. But if we could get moved to a half dose or even a quarter dose, that would obviously uh, very, you know, have a huge impact on vaccine capacity. So um, when we go to the next slide. Um, so if you would go one more and then maybe we'll come back to this. So I think the, um, in this situation where there's very large potential benefits from, uh, from other ways of, of, of delivering vaccines, uh, from lowering the doses, from uh, a first doses first approach. I think information on the impact of this would be very valuable. In fact, it would be valuable to the world as a whole the, the, because that information could affect vaccine policy in many countries. It'd be particularly valuable for low and middle income countries, which tend to be at the back of the queue and don't have access to too many doses. You know, less valuable for the the U.S. or 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 U.K. or U.A.E. or Israel, which already have a lot of uh, of doses. Um, the um, how would we find this out? Well, we'd find out through additional vaccine trials, and those could be done um, by conducting dosing strategies head to head. You could try the st st uh, status quo dosing strategy against a, a single dose against uh, smaller doses. You wouldn't necessarily need a control group because the comparison would be not to um, not to not getting a vaccine at all, but com comparing to the uh, existing vaccines. So those those that could be embedded. Those trials could be embedded in vaccine rollouts and done at very large scale. Um, and this would be low risk because the safety has already been tested. Um, in the language of economics, this would have a very large option value. If we found out that the that going with a half dose or a quarter dose um, provided the same protection as the, the current status quo dose, you know, that would have immense benefits for the world. Um, would save many lives. Would allow our economies and societies to go back to to uh, to get back to something approaching normalcy much much more quickly. Um, if it turned out that this didn't work, you know, then at that point. Um, you could provide the second dose to people who got who hadn't got it. You could um, provide uh, follow up uh, uh, larger doses to people if needed. So there's there's you know, the benefits are huge. The, uh, the sorry, let me restate that. The potential benefits are huge. The downside is very limited. But there's not much incentive for a private firm to finance these trials. They really need to be funded publicly. And because the benefits would be global, I think there's a very strong case for international organizations to support these trials. So I think this is one of the highest, uh, highest priority investments that could be made. Let me go back a slide. Um, okay. Um, um, I mentioned one other thing that, that could be done which is to make sure that we use all available vaccines. So, you know, there's different vaccines out there. They differ in a variety of ways. Some, some uh, may have lower efficacy, some have higher efficacy. This is, you know, they all pr have pretty high efficacy against the, the most severe forms of the disease, but they have, they have different efficacy against less severe forms. Um, and there, you know, there might be different efficacy against different strains, uh, obviously, um, you know, different storage requirements, et cetera. So different, um, using all of these as soon as they're available globally will provide the most social benefit. Um, you know, I've already talked about the, the importance of speed. Um, we've done some calculations. You know, if, if a country had an access to a 70% effective vaccine now or 95% effective one in three months, you know, we find that there are higher benefits from starting with the immediately available one. So, for countries that are in that situation, I think the important thing is to get some vaccine out right away. Um, but the the other, when we go on to uh, maybe skip two slides, um, but given that different countries will have different access to different vaccines, they sign different contracts, and the vaccines have different characteristics, countries may have different needs or preferences, 
and countries might end up with vaccine allocations that aren't optimally matched to their needs. And that means that there could be gains in terms of utilization of all the vaccines on a global basis if, if, um, if there was a vaccine exchange mechanism uh, probably run through COVAX that would enable countries to engage in mutually beneficial trades. I think that's, um, you know, I, I may not have all my facts straight, but I think the U.S. is, is um, sitting on some vaccines now that it's not using, but it's not, um, it's not really sitting on some vaccine capacity that isn't authorized for the U.S., um, but that other countries might be able to use. That's a, a crazy situation, and it makes sense to find ways to either do exchanges or donations uh, to address that issue. We go on to the next slide. Um, okay. Um, just to conclude, um, I think the value of investing to expand vaccine capacity is still very large. You know, just to um, re refine that argument a little bit, I mean, you know, there is a lot of uncertainty. We don't know uh, what's going to happen. That's been a characteristic of this epidemic throughout. But I think if if we think about the asymmetries, if we invested in capacity now and it turned out that that capacity couldn't be, uh, could, that you know, didn't come online or that the epidemic um, finished uh, and you know, just went away um, uh, before it could come online, well, maybe we've spent a, a few billion dollars. But the opposite scenario, where, there's, um, where we have less effective capacity than we believe because of, either because of production difficulties or because of of new strains that mean that we can't use all of the existing vaccines. Um, there, we're talking about you know, losing hundreds of billions or, or trillions of dollars a month and you know, hundreds of thousands of lives. So that asymmetry means it's, it's really worth doing what we can to further expand investment, even at this late date. So soliciting bids from firms to identify opportunities makes sense. Um, this contract should include provisions for capacity investment, and we should be trying to address supply chain constraints as well as the uh, final production. And then finally, I think it makes sense to find ways to use existing capacity more efficiently. Uh, if we can, we can you know, think about trade-offs between speed and efficacy, think about things like first doses first or, 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 uh, or adjusting the dosage. We'll need trials probably to, to do that, um, but Invest in those trials is, uh, is is very valuable. And finally, we should have some sort of cross-country um, uh, vaccine exchange. Um, very happy to to hear reactions and and discuss these issues. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Michael, for for your uh, lecture. Uh, very very clear. Your case for speed was was well taken. Uh, I have uh, I have uh, maybe a couple of questions, but I want to take advantage of, of my position of, of moderating. So I know that there is um, Hans as a question, so uh, I'll uh, I'll give uh, him uh, the floor, and there is a question on the chat box. So, but Hans, uh, uh, please start with your question. Good morning, and thanks so much, Michael. Uh, fascinating uh, overview. Also, from South Asia's perspective, it's it's very helpful to have that global overview. You, you made that important point that not just the supply of vaccines is enormously valuable, but the speed of supply is 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 really valuable. And and you would assume that that would be reflected in in price differentiation, that those who uh, get the vaccines first they pay a higher price. The reality seems to be the opposite. It seems to be that developing countries, when they try to purchase beyond the COVAX uh, supply, they pay actually a relatively high price relative to what high income countries have negotiated. Uh, so, so my question is, how, how do you see the, the inefficiency of that price differentiation? And, and then a related question is, uh, what what is the economic rationale behind the fact that these negotiated advanced market uh, placements uh, are not being disclosed so that we don't actually know what prices are being paid and, and what the price uh, differentiation is. So, so what is the economic rationale there? Because it seems when speed is so important, 
that price differentiation is also important. Thank you so much. Uh, question up. Um, so the first issue is, you know, why aren't the first doses being sold for more? And, you know, we estimate that the social value of of those initial doses is indeed much, much higher than the social value of, of, of later doses. Completely agree with you on that. In, in some types of markets, um, you know, if this were, if, if the if the vaccines were all being allocated through a global auction system, uh, then um, then you know perhaps we would see that reflected in the prices. But in fact, the the prices here are very influenced by political and legal and ethical constraints. And um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that translate into fairness. Uh, the, um, and in fact, there's you know a lot of unfairness in the system. And you're you're you know you're pointing out one one form of that. Um, I will say that even the higher prices, so for example, when South Africa went outside and bought additional uh, doses, you know, they had to pay a higher price for that. That, if, if, if nonetheless, despite paying a higher price than the, uh, than the, uh, the price that, you know, some of the other prices out there, it's still an enormous bargain. If you look at it from the standpoint of the, but if you're looking at this as a finance ministry, and you think about the, um, the loss, just the pure amount that countries are spending on, on dealing with the epidemic and the huge macroeconomic losses, you know, paying for vaccine doses is, is an incredibly uh, high return on investment um, uh, way of, of spending funds. So it's, uh, if you're sitting in a finance ministry and you don't control the global system, um, but you have to think about the interests of your country, I would st it's still worth paying to go beyond the um, the uh, the COVAX allocation. Uh, what we need to think about from a global system point of view is how to address this problem in the future. And I think the way to address the problem in the future is a key element of that is to make sure that there's a lot that we have to basically invest in enough intermediate uh, input production. Uh, make sure there's enough bioreactors, enough you know delivery devices, glass vials, et cetera, enough adjuvants, enough raw materials to deal with a, a pandemic should it appear. And you know that's both a you know, that will require some public investment because uh, the private sector won't won't you know pay to stockpile those things um, on the chance that an epidemic will occur. And you know some of this will become obsolete. So I don't want to claim there's zero costs. But this is a cost that's measured in the billions of dollars globally and you know could obviously avert catastrophe so it's it's worth doing um and it would i think have the side benefit um uh of helping having that if there is that capacity in place enough for the world then there's much less temptation for individual countries to start doing things that create negative externalities for other countries like prohibiting exports or uh, or trying to you know sort of seize, buy up all the available capacity or something like that. Um, the second part of your question had to do with transparency. Um, I don't know whether my co-author Chris Snyder is on the line. Are, are you on the line, Chris? Okay. Um, um, well, let me see if I can take a crack at it. I, I would just say that the issues about whether contracts should be public. You know, Chris is an industrial organization economist who, who specializes in this type of question. Um, it's actually a complicated question. Um, you know, there are maybe potential benefits of, of that, but there's also potential downsides. So, you know, one standard result in industrial organization, not specifically about vaccines and not necessarily about public procurement, but, you know, sometimes having, um, if if all contracts, if you're thinking, if you're a manufacturer and you're thinking about giving a discount, well, you might not want to give a discount if you think that's going to force you to give a discount next time. So you might be more reluctant to give a discount if 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 you think everything's going to become transparent, or if there's collusion among manufacturers, that may be easier to enforce if there's transparency. So uh, or. We call it public information. I'll be more technical. The transparency sounds, I guess, the transparency sounds like, oh, that's got to be a good thing. Um, and it may well be that the, the unbalanced transparency would, the benefits outweigh the costs, but there are potential costs. I think this requires, you know, careful thought. Um, 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 and I would focus right now, I would focus more on expanding supply so we can expand speed or accelerate delivery. That seems the first order issue to me. 
Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, there's, there's, there was one more question uh, that I can pass along. So the uh, clearly, uh, if we don't have the vaccine doses, if we don't have the production, uh, we, we can't uh, even discuss the next step. But the next step is important. Uh, once uh, once uh, the doses are there, we we observe issues in delivering the doses from from where they are arrived in the airport to to the actual arms uh, and bodies of of the people. Do you see? Do you see any? Uh, probably the arguments are equivalent there. We should uh, also invest in the capacity of delivering this. Or what is your thoughts there? What are your thoughts? You're, you're, you're muted. You're muted. Sorry. Uh, and uh, this, yes, you're, I completely agree. The same logic that that says there's huge, uh, um, you know. Uh, economic as well as health value to accelerating production. Obviously, that that value is only realized if those vaccines reach people. So, uh, having a delivery system that functions well is is vitally important. Um, you know, I I spoke about production because that's the topic that I've been been working on. But um, you know, the the delivery is also really vital. Uh, okay, uh, great. Uh, I um, yeah, I think I, I don't see any other uh, question. So maybe I'll I'll, uh, I'll ask one, which is related to what uh, uh, what uh, the, the the discussion that you we just had uh, earlier. But that is one one of the one of the uh, issue that you mentioned is that the there may be a, a supply constraint in the intermediary uh, goods to the to the production and. Uh, uh, you 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 said that uh, it's it's probably very difficult to think of a large private investment because demand is temporary uh, for for the vaccine potentially. So you it, it wanna be it's gonna be idle for for the long run. So it doesn't make a lot of sense. But uh, you also there's was also mentioned that the price of output is fixed. Now um, is it is it uh, can we have a discussion about someone can pay more? Uh, uh, or, or is this part of the of the uh, auction uh, and the way that the prices are decided? I, I, I'm just reiterating a little bit the discussion of can can the price not be fixed and, and someone can afford to pay more? Sorry again, permuted. Sorry, but. Good now. Great. Um, the um, so I I think that you know there are very important global equity issues uh, here, and you know, there are multiple ways to address that. So if we think about um, the benefits of, of 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 averting the next pandemic or being able to deal with the next pandemic, you know that is really something that um, from at an economic from an economic standpoint, most of the benefits will go to higher income countries. Um, so if we think about what's equitable financing for uh, putting in these stockpiles of vaccines for financing, uh, sorry, stockpiles of intermediate inputs for vaccines, um, stock, um, perhaps financing uh, production capacities, so factories that could produce you know, bioreactors or glass vials and, and, and so on. Um, you know, who should cover the costs of, of that? Well, you know, the biggest beneficiaries are probably going to be the high income countries. Um, and so it probably makes sense for them to do a disproportionate share of the financing. Um, you know, that could be done in a variety of ways. First, they could just put out more cash. Um, second, you could say that if the if you know part of the contract could potentially be that the output from these factories that there'd be it would be sold at cost or closer to cost for you know for low income countries or for low and middle income countries. Uh, that there are various ways to to design systems like that. Um, but I, I agree that thinking about equity and financing of this uh, does make sense. Okay. Uh, I, uh, there's just one, one question that uh, came a, a moment ago, so I'm just reading it out uh, for you. Uh, um, okay, so the question is about the, the, a bit of demand side. And it goes like this: What would it take to build acceptability 
for head-to-head -head trials. Uh, different vaccine should be fine by different doses, maybe uh, more different. Any uh, thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, I think, am I not muted? I think somebody keeps muting me. Okay, great. Um, so I think that um, having a, um, if you think about willingness to join a trial, you know, probably you wouldn't be doing the trial among the among the elderly or or health workers. It would probably be people like uh, people like me who are who would be further back in the queue, um, and so or people younger than me for that matter. And the um, if you're thinking about somebody who's further back in the queue, if I think about myself, if I had the chance to volunteer for a trial tomorrow or I might get the full dose, or I might get a, a partial dose. And I should emphasize that the pharmacological models suggest these partial doses might be just as effective. You know, I would, if, if my alternative right now is to wait without any vaccine at all, I'd be very happy to sign up for a trial like that. And obviously, if it turns out that the trial, if I get the high dose, great. If I get the lower dose, that might also turn out to be fine. If it doesn't turn out to be fine, you know, part of the provisions in the trial can be, we'll, we'll, we'll you know, arrange the participants in the trial. If the data come back suggesting that if a larger dose is necessary, then they would get the the full dose, for example. So, um, so the um, so I think that there'd be plenty of people who would want to sign up for a trial like this. If you did have a trial like this, then that would um, and that was done with a large sample size, and you got results quickly. You know, that could uh, have huge benefits for the world. So I think this could be done. Obviously, it has to be. Uh, it could be done ethically. Um, it would. It does need to be financed, and I think we. You know, that's something that uh, um, individual countries should think about. Organizations like the, the World Bank should think about. Certainly, uh, donors and philanthropists should think about it. And um, and um, I, 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 you know, I guess I, I would say that's a very high priority for the world. I think it's doable.